This is a short overview of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD for short. I'll be talking about the etiology of COPD, the pathophysiology of this disease, how COPD might present in the hospital or in the clinic, how to diagnose COPD, how to chronically manage COPD, what an acute exacerbation of COPD looks like, and what to do about that as well. So let's get started. First, let's talk about the etiology of COPD. The majority of cases of COPD in the United States or in the Western world um, occur in smokers. So 90% of patients with COPD were or are smokers. <clears throat> this doesn't mean that everybody who smokes gets COPD. About 20% of smokers get COPD, but the majority of people with COPD in the Western world are smokers. And a bit of pathophysiology, um, essentially tobacco destroys the elastin fibers in your lungs. And when you breathe, you take a deep breath in using your muscles to expand your chest cavity. But the majority of work in exhalation is actually your elastic lungs and chest wall kind of coming back together like a balloon deflating. And um, that nice elasticity comes from these elastin fibers and tobacco destroys those elastin fibers. So when that goes away, um, you have airway collapse and you end up with lungs that are kind of hyper inflated that aren't able to exhale, that aren't able to blow air out. And we'll show some pictures of that in um, the pathophysiology in the, in, in the other slides. <clears throat> there's also other environmental factors that can cause COPD. In other countries, there's poorly ventilated cooking fires. And I think this is one of the more common causes in um, some less developed countries. Exhaust fires can also cause COPD, and there are occupational exposures, such as people that work in mining industries and chemical industries and some textile industries can predispose people to COPD. There is a genetic cause of COPD as well. It's called alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, and this is something you might suspect in a patient who presents with these signs and symptoms that we'll talk about, but they're young or they've never smoked, um, or they have a family history of somebody who had COPD and was also at a young age non-smoker. So alpha-1 antitrypsin is, is worth knowing. And there's, there's some other symptoms that you'll notice with this. It also affects your liver, so you can present with hepatitis, um, but it's worth looking into alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. So let's talk about the pathophysiology of COPD. There are two, it's similar to asthma, there are two mechanisms going on here. There's airway inflammation and there's also bronchoconstriction. What makes COPD different from asthma is that the bronchoconstriction is irreversible. So albuterol doesn't really work to fix COPD. Um, the, when thinking about the, the pathophysiology of COPD, you can kind of divide it into two components. And classically, people would present as, or classically it was taught that people present as one of these two distinct phenotypes. The two distinct phenotypes are pink puffers and blue bloaters, which are associated with emphysema and chronic bronchitis, respectively. So I'll be talking about both of those kind of individually, but know that in reality, most patients are a combination of both, and um, you can very well have some um, components of this pathophysiology combined with some components of the other pathophysiology. So in emphysema, you have fibrosis in the lungs, which leads to lower elasticity in the lungs, as we already mentioned. Um, this makes it harder to exhale. The air is trapped in your lungs. So that's what makes it an obstructive airway disease. You're kind of accumulating that air. You might notice these patients using their accessory muscles, their intercostals, to exhale. So it kind of becomes difficult to exhale. Um, there's increased work of breathing. And because of this increased work of breathing, these patients might have weight loss. They might have muscle wasting or cachexia. They, on exam, can have a hyperinflated barrel chest, and we'll show some pictures of that on x-ray as well. They'll have an increased AP diameter. This is a, an, an, an AP x-ray is like an anterior-posterior x-ray, so it's taken from, um, from like kind of your side, and you can see that the diameter from the front of their chest to their back is increased. We'll show pictures of that. During percussion uh, on exam of the lungs, they might have hyperresonance because they have so much air built up in there. And these people will have prolonged expiration, um, again, because it's hard for them to exhale because the air is trapped in their lungs. The airways can collapse during expiration, and this can lead to increased resistance, so it makes it harder to breathe out, kind of the same themes we're talking about, um, which can lead to increased effort, and these people will often have pursed lips um, when exhaling, and that's 
kind of where the pink puffers come from. They are pink because they don't have hypoxemia, they have pink complexion, unlike the blue bloaters, which we'll talk about in a second, and they're puffers because they have so much resistance, so much effort when they expire through pursed lips. In general, there's alveolar wall damage and remodeling. We'll show a picture of those in a second. You end up with reduced surface area for gas transfer. So because they have less area for gas transfer, they have to take more breaths to get as much oxygen in and as much carbon dioxide out. So they might be uh, tachypneic. In chronic bronchitis, the blue bloater picture, these people have a chronic productive cough. So on exam, you might hear crackles and wheezing. They also have prolonged expiration. And I think the technical definition for chronic bronchitis is somebody who coughs for more than three months in two consecutive years. So that's kind of the length of time that makes it officially chronic bronchitis. These people might have mucus production that blocks their larger airways, um, also making it hard to get air out, also trapping the air in their lungs. And because of this ongoing inflammation, bronchitis, mucus production, they might have damage to the cilia. And the cilia, you know, are supposed to kind of remove junk that gets into your lungs, that kind of clear the mucus that gets in their lungs. So if they have ciliary damage and mucus production, it's, gonna, it's kind of a double whammy, right? You're producing too much mucus, and you're also damaging the uh, little organs that kind of clear that mucus. They might have increased glo uh, goblet cells as well, which are, which are the cells in the lungs that secrete the mucus. So in people that have chronic bronchitis, they end up with increased pulmonary vascular resistance. Now the pathophysiology here is, is, uh, is worth knowing, so bear with me for a second. Normally in the body, if you have low oxygen and high carbon dioxide in the systemic circulation in the blood, it causes the vessels to dilate. And the reason for that is that you want to get blood to parts of the body that have low oxygen. So you vasodilate to get more blood to those areas. In the pulmonary circulation, you kind of have the opposite effect. If you have low oxygen, your pulmonary vasculature vasoconstricts. Now this happens because the, the goal of the pulmonary circulation is to have as much oxygen enter the lungs as possible. So if there's a part of the lung that is getting less oxygen, the pulmonary circulation is going to vasoconstrict those arteries to kind of shunt the blood away to other parts of the lung that might be getting more oxygen. The problem with chronic bronchitis is that all of the bronchioles are getting low amounts of oxygen. So the response is to vasoconstrict a lot of the bronchioles. This leads to pulmonary vascular resistance that is higher than normal. And if the pulmonary vascular resistance is high, then the right heart is going to suffer. This is called core pulmonale. So heart damage that is because of the circulatory system, right ventricular strain. So the right ventricle, which leads into the pulmonary vasculature, is straining. So you can end up with a large right heart. Um, we might see a picture of that, or right atrial enlargement, or right ventricular hypertrophy. But because of that, you might also have some symptoms that you typically see with other right heart failure, like uh, peripheral edema, like increased JVD, and hepatosplenomegaly. So essentially, your blood's circulatory system is all backing up behind the lungs. That's pretty important to know. In people with chronic bronchitis, you again have inflammation everywhere, and that leads to decreased gas transfer. So you end up with lower oxygen levels, and that can even show as like a bluish color to the skin and lips if they're really hypoxic. And if you have low oxygen levels, that can also cause clubbing in the fingers. So all of these are kind of related chronic bronchitis, increased pulmonary vascular resistance, right heart failure, symptoms of right heart failure. All of this is happening because of decreased gas transfer and low oxygen levels, clubbing. They all make the picture of blue bloaters. Um, people that are bloated, they have edema, they might be obese, and they're blue because they're hypoxic. But again, most patients are a combination of both of these phenotypes. So these are classic teachings, pink puffers and blue bloaters. In reality, it's a combination of both. Here's what it looks like when you have a combination of both. In normal lungs, you have these nice air sacs, these nice alveoli that are kind of separated and distinct and have a lot of surface area because there's a lot of thin walls between them. In lungs with COPD, the bronchioles essentially lose their shape. They become clogged with mucus. They become backed up. Air gets trapped inside, and the walls of the alveoli become destroyed. They become fibrotic. They kind of scar up, and you have these large chambers, these these 
they, there are fewer chambers because they're all kind of meshing together and merging together. But like, look at this large deformed alveoli compared to these nice smaller alveoli. Here's a picture of it under the microscope. So on the right here, you have relatively healthy alveoli. You can kind of see that they're separated air sacs by these thin walls. And then this would be a picture of emphysema, where you have the walls that are kind of falling together, blending together, leaving you with these large, round air sacs that aren't really functional, that aren't really elastic like they used to be. How does this present in the clinic or in the hospital? Um, it kind of all boils down to these symptoms shown here, specifically cough and shortness of breath. Systemically, they might be tired, they might have weight loss, that's kind of that pink puffer picture. Um, in the lungs, cough, shortness of breath, wheezing, chest tightness, and that blue bloater picture is kind of showing here with the ankle swelling. Um, again, secondary to right heart failure, core pulmonale. So that's a lot of pathophysiology for a relatively simple presentation, cough and shortness of breath. Now, how do we diagnose this? First, we can do pulmonary function tests. This is similar to what we see in asthma. The forced expiratory volume in one second is low, less than 80% of what would be expected for that patient. The forced vital capacity is also low. The total lung volume in this case is high, and this is because the lungs have a high residual volume. Remember, residual volume is the amount of air that's left in your lungs after exhaling completely. And because air is trapped in COPD, because uh, you have trouble exhaling as much air as a person who doesn't have COPD, you have a high residual volume and the total lung capacity can be high. And of course your diffusion across the lungs is also low here, so you have a low DLCO. It's important to note that, pulmonary, that on, your pulmonary function test deficits are not reversible with bronchodilators. If they were reversible, you would suspect asthma. So the threshold, the number that's cited in the literature is that if you have at least a 12% increase in FEV1 with albuterol, then you suspect something like asthma. If you have a non-reversible problem, if you have a non-reversible decrease in FEV1, and when you give albuterol, you have a less than 12% increase, then you suspect COPD. Similar, uh, comparing to asthma, your lung function tests are not worsened with acetylcholine as they would be in asthma. Now there are some other tests that show a lot of helpful indicators of COPD. Firstly, on chest x-ray, you'll see enlarged lungs, an increased anterior-posterior diameter, a flattened diaphragm, air trapping, translucent lung fields, and a rotated heart silhouette. Uh, that's from right uh, ventricular hypertrophy, as we mentioned due to the core pulmonale in the pathology slide. Let's show some pictures of that. So this is a lateral chest x-ray in a person with emphysema. So here you can see that barrel chest. The diaphragm at the bottom is very flat. Usually that's more curved. Um, and you, This is a much larger diameter than in a healthy person without COPD. So this is a side profile of somebody. I think they're facing probably the right in this picture. And this is a um, this is a a very large AP diameter. This is a picture of somebody from the front. You can see that there's very enlarged lungs here. You can see a flattened diaphragm all the way to the bottom. Um, it looks like there's air trapping and the note for this one was a severe case of bullous emphysema. So you can kind of see the fibrosis and the probably inflammation in there kind of creating here. I'll, I'll go back to this picture. Kind of creating this picture but on an x-ray. So imagine that on an x-ray um, ends up looking like a bunch of fibrotic stuff of bullous emphysema um, on that lung here. So people on complete blood counts might also have erythrocytosis, that's high red blood cells. They might also have a high hematocrit. This is essentially a body's compensatory mechanism for hypoxemia. If the body has low oxygen, its response is going to be to increase the red blood cells, to increase the hematocrit, to try to compensate for that. On EKG, again, you might see right heart enlargement. Um, so right atrial enlargement and right ventricular hypertrophy. This is again from the pulmonary hypertension. So if there's high pressure in the lungs, in the lung circulatory system, that backs up into the heart and the heart is working over time to try to push blood through the pulmonary circuit. On an arterial blood gas, you might have increased PCO2, decreased O2. Um, this is a respiratory acidosis. And to compensate, the blood, or the body will have a high bicarb on a BMP. So those are just some lab tests that you might see associated with COPD. Now this is how you chronically manage COPD. So 
a lot of the treatments we give are based on severity, so they're kind of personalized. How bad is their COPD? This is how much we're going to intervene. For everyone, these are three things that everybody with COPD should get, and um, they have mortality benefits. So first, stop smoking. Um, if they are smokers, that definitely has a mortality benefit. You want to make sure they get vaccines for influenza and pneumococcus. This is also important for people with asthma, so make sure people with obstructive lung disease get influenza and pneumococcus vaccines. Now, supplemental home oxygen. This is pretty important. The mortality is proportional to the number of oxygen hours you get. So um, the more hours of oxygen you get, the better. But that doesn't mean that you want to put them on 100% oxygen all the time. You actually don't want to give them too much oxygen. There's this question of hypoxic drive, so you don't want to give them too much oxygen so that you don't suppress their hypoxic drive. In general, you want all patients with COPD to have a pulse ox reading of at least 88%. So if they have uh, any kind of COPD, you want to give them enough oxygen so that their pulse ox reads 88%. You can also go by the arterial blood gas, the PO2. You want that to be at least 55, and that's in all patients. If a patient is showing cardiorespiratory signs of hypoxemia, so this includes high hematocrit on CBC, this includes pulmonary hypertension, or cardiomyopathy, like right ventricular hypertrophy, you want to give them a little more oxygen. So you want their arterial blood gas, PO2, to be at least 60, or you want their pulse ox to be at least 90 in those patients. So the minimum should be 88, unless they have right heart failure hypoxemia, then they should be at 90 for their pulse ox. In general, most people with COPD will be on bronchodilators for their rescue bronchodilator. You're going to use a short-acting beta agonist. This is an inhaler like albuterol. You can also try both long-acting muscarinic antagonists. This is LAMA, LAMAs. These are anticholinergics like ipratropium or acidinium or teotropium is another cop, uh, common one. These are generally better than long-acting beta agonists like fometerol or salmeterol. Uh, you could also use both at the same time. It's important to know that in a patient with asthma, you would never use a long-acting beta agonist without an inhaled corticosteroids, but in the case of COPD, you can. You can also add inhaled corticosteroids in COPD, that's like budesonide, and this is a drug that's unique to COPD, these PDE4 inhibitors like theophylline or roflumilast, and these can be added. So in general, you kind of start with the rescue inhaler and go down this list, add these drugs. At the very end, lastly, you can try oral steroids. There's a bunch of side effects to oral steroids like prednisone, so you want to have patients on that as little as possible. It can cause Cushing syndrome, it can cause fat redistribution, it can cause skin changes like thinning of the skin and other problems, so uh, osteoporosis, I believe. So you do want to try to avoid oral steroids as much as possible. There's some other things that have shown uh, to have benefits. There's pulmonary rehab that they can do, including pulmonary toilet. This can reduce dyspnea. It can improve exercise tolerance, but there's really no shown mortality benefit, but it can make patients feel better. There's actually a surgery to reduce your lung volume, and that has shown some benefit. And, uh, of course, transplant is an option for some patients that have stopped smoking, that have a decent life expectancy. So that's something that you might consider in very few cases. Lastly, let's look at the acute exacerbations and what to do about it. So again, you want to supplement them with oxygen, um, this time uh, in general, until their uh, pulse ox is at least 88 to 92%. You don't need to get them all the way to 100%. You don't need to get them to 95%. So at least this range would be good. You give them a nebulizer. So you can give them ipratropium or albuterol. Oftentimes you give them both at the same time. If there's no improvement on nebulizer, you can add a PO or IV steroid. If they have signs of infection, like purulent sputum, uh, sputum or a fever, they usually give them antibiotics. So it's true that up to half of COPD exacerbations are caused by viruses, but some are caused by antibiotics, and a lot of times you'll treat empirically for these bugs, so strep pneumo, H. flu, and moroxella. You can consider, there's a long list of antibiotics that you can consider, and sometimes they kind of rotate through these drugs uh, just to cover everything, but amox plus minus clavulonic acid, um, TM, uh, TMP SMX, azithromycin, doxycycline, fluoroquinolones, cephalosporins are all drugs that have been used in COPD exacerbations. As a last resort, if you really can't control their uh, SpO2, if you really can't control their 
increased work of breathing, you might consider intubation and mechanical ventilation. Um, this would be pretty bad probably in the ICU at that point. This has been an overview of COPD. I hope it was helpful and thank you for listening.